Assalamu alaikum. Um, welcome uh, for another episode of The Doc is In. Uh, today the topic is uh, skull base uh, surgery uh, at Cleveland Clinic uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, we were honored uh, here recently to be uh, designated by the North American Skull Base Society to be uh, one of the uh, multidisciplinary uh, team of distinction. And uh, today uh, we have uh, Dr. Samuel Hamadi uh, from uh, neurosurgery, consultant neurosurgery, and uh, myself, uh, Dr. Mahdi Shkoukani, uh, Department Chair for Otolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery. And we uh, both we will be uh, talking uh, about uh, uh, our program here in skull base surgery. Uh, Dr. Sami, uh, thank you again for uh, joining us today. Uh, can you uh, tell the audience what is skull base surgery? Sure. Uh, so I think first before describing what skull base surgery is, we should talk about what is, you know, what is the skull base, what's unique about it and its challenges. So as as the, you know, the uh, the norm implies, it's the the name implies, it's the base of the skull and it's uh, has a very challenging diff and difficult anatomy. Um, it's very difficult to reach at, sur um, at surgery. And, there, and it's kind of like the boundary of, of several uh, specialties. And that's, and that's what makes it kind of, kind of unique because you can have this overlap of the various disciplines. So I'll give you an example. So for example, the, uh, you have ophthalmologists. They can operate th through the eye directly into, uh, into the orbit, right? But then, but also, the, but the roof of the orbit, right, is shared with the uh, with the brain, right. So the neurosurgeon can reach can reach the orbit from above. Similarly, you can reach the medial aspect of the uh, of the orbit from from below through the nose. So that's shared with with uh, you know with my A and T colleagues, right, um, and and so forth. Uh, we you have tumors involving the uh, can involve the base of the skull that can be approached through the through the nose in collaboration or could, or from or, or from above, and um, it's this, when we can collaborate, we bring our expertise from these different specialties, right? Then we can definitely, you know, be able to, to take on these challenging cases. Each, each discipline comes in with their own expertise and we can then, and we can take care of the, you know, these, these challenging lesions. So that's kind of what, this is how uh, the skull base, skull base surgery came to develop, you know? Oh, okay, interesting. So you know, you know, you know, just to ask you, a, you know, a question is: Can you tell me kind of how how did endoscopic skull base surgery kind of develop? Well, you know, uh, skull base surgery in uh, you know in general started actually over hundred years ago. Uh, you know, obviously uh, was mainly at that time, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, at that time, you know, neurosurgery they were doing their things. Otolaryngologists were doing their things. Um, at that time, there was no endoscopes, uh, you know, a hundred years ago. But in the mid 1900s, they started to develop some of these endoscopes. They were not high quality. Uh, toward the end of the last century, um, they started um, uh, trialing uh, these uh, endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, you know, in the mid 80s, uh, that started uh, getting some popularity, and then. That's as you mentioned, you know, otolaryngologists and uh, neurosurgeons kind of uh, share a lot of uh, shared land between the two uh, fields. Um, you know, that's where the endoscopic skull based surgery started to develop. That's when they uh, say, you know, uh, looking at the cribriform plate instead of doing uh, large bicoronals and bifrontal crani. Uh, you know, now you can go just directly through the nose and, and, and access that. And that what helped us in the mid 1990s uh, and early this century is the, again, the advancement in the technology that we have, the quality of the endoscopes, the, the in, you know, the, the stuff that we use, uh, like the endoscope to clear, uh, the, you know, the, the blood during surgery, so it makes our access uh, uh, much easier. Um, so all that stuff together with uh, uh, a lot of uh, effort from uh, skull base surgeons, uh, both sides of the neurosurgery and otolaryngology, they were able to, to really advance this uh, endoscopic skull base to where we are uh, today. All right. Um, and since we are on that topic of endoscopic skull base, uh, I mean, can you tell the audience, uh, Dr. Sami, 
what's the advantage and disadvantage of doing endoscopic? It seems like, yes, a lot of shift was going for endoscopic, but uh, I am sure still the open approach still may be needed in some, some cases. And uh, so if you can just share. Uh, sure. With the audience that, so uh, that's, that's kind of like two, uh, I think what you're alluding to, you're talking about, you're, you're specifically alluding to using the endoscope for endonasal, endonasal surgery. But you have to remember, so the endoscope is really, it's just a, visual, it's a visualization tool, right? And uh, in fact, neurosurgeons use the endoscope in, uh, in many ways. We can use them uh, uh, even transcranially, intraventricularly, to, uh, intraventricularly to remove tumors. We can use it as an, uh, for, uh, uh, as an, uh, to assist our microscopic surgeries to be able to look around corners and things like that. With In regards to the uh, end, and, and endonasal uh, endoscopic surgery. So if you, you you remember historically, we used to do these, um, traditionally our, our incisions were, I remember when I first started learning, we used to make, the, you know, we used to uh, access the nose on, under the lip. We used to make incision underneath the lip. Um, uh, occasionally you can, uh, do, you know, you can make your incision just in the, uh, right at the nasal septum. Sometimes we'd go straight with the septum through a speculum. We didn't really respect the, uh, the you know, the nasal anatomy so much. We just kind of, cr you know, just open the speculum kind of crush the nasal structures. Um, uh, and that's kind of the way we, we used to do it. And it was all done in the visualization tool th that we used was the microscope. Now, in the microscope, as you know, the uh, what you have the camera and the light source are, are, are outside uh, um, uh, of the nose, right? And you're and, uh, uh, and, oh, quite far away from the field. So the amount of vi the, the visualization that you get and the amount of light that you can actually get into the nose, it's, it's, it's somewhat limited, uh, particularly when you compare it to the endoscope. And the endoscope, now you're taking, you're actually taking the, 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 the camera, you're taking the, the light source and you're introducing it into the nose right at the, right where you're working. So it gives you the, the illumination is, is, uh, is, you know, is, is excellent. Um, uh, it gives you this beautiful, nice panoramic view, a wider field of view. Um, and then, as you know, the endoscopes, uh, you have angled endoscopes. So uh, unlike a, mi a microscope, it's only just, it, what you, can't, you can't look around corners, right? But with an endo endoscope and with these, angled, uh, with, the, with these different lenses, angled lenses, you can look around the corners. So you can, um, and obviously the advantages here, are, so number one is the advantage uh, going, uh, using an endoscope is that you're, it's, you're, less, tra you're less traumatic. Um, uh, go, accessing the you know accessing the skull base. Number two, you get a better visualization um, with uh, and, uh, and illumination, and the be able to looking around corners. So then the surgery is not only safer, you're able to uh, less traumatic. You're able to you know more effectively remove tumors, and, and it decreases the incidence of uh, of leaving tumor remnants behind. So. Uh, I think that kind of summarizes it, you know. Yeah, absolutely, and, I, and I'll pick up on that. Uh, uh, actually, uh, when you mentioned about the speculum and when you were accessing the pituitary, and this is where I feel that it was more, was not as much of a multidisciplinary because there was a neurosurgeon going through the nose or going through sublabially to access the pituitary, where you know with the endoscopic that actually brought. Uh, the teams together, you know, where, you know, we can help as an otolaryngologist, I can give you the access. I can take down, open up the sinuses, clear out the skull base, uh, you know, even when we do like pituitary, we even take down the cella uh, up to the dura, and that's where we uh, we prepare the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the site for the new surgeons to access mainly, obviously, intracranially or more like if they have to remove a tumor in the skull base region. Um, so, so taking that as an otolaryngologist, yes, we do the access and we work on the you know reconstruction of the CSF leak, and I'm sure we'll discuss this later. But for you, I mean, as a neurosurgeon, I mean, how do you see yourself removing a tumor uh, endoscopically versus like how you were doing it? you know, traditionally, uh, you know, intra like from an open approach. Okay, so the, uh, so first of all, uh, you know, just to uh, elaborate a little more on what you said, it, I think also the, uh, the the beauty of working together with, with an ENT surgeon is that uh, you, is, is not only for the surgery, I'm talking about the post-operative care, the post-operative care of the patients. Um, uh, you know, we didn't, you know, as I, I remember, you know, for me, seeing these patients post-op, you know, they'd 
complain of many things, that, you know, this crusting, this bad smell in their nose. And for, for me, it, I, it, you know, it, it's not my specialty, so, and I wouldn't even scope them po postoperatively or anything. So uh, now that, you know, you work, you, you work in this multidisciplinary team with an ENT surgeon, it's definitely better for the patients and it's, it's better for the postoperative nasal care and so forth. So I just wanted to, to elaborate on that. With, in, you know, so your question was, with, in regards to the you know the tumor surgeries and rese and, and, and resections or, or what my role is here. So the the ENT role obviously is to, you're, you gave me the access to down to the tumor right, and then together we work together. Um, you holding the endoscope and, and, and providing the, you know, giving me a good view uh, of the tumor. And the, the, you know, the endoscope, the visualization is, 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 is great. So you can really s differentiate between abnormal tissue and normal tissue nor and, 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 and different structures really much more clearly than you could, than you could with, uh, with the microscope. The endoscope is really ideal for, you know, for midline lesions of the skull base, right? But, you know, but you and you're working between like these important vi vital structures. So you're working between uh, you have the cr carotid arteries that you're working between. You're working between the the optic nerves. So uh, lesions that are with you know that are that are between these structures for the most part are primarily between these stru these these structures. Those are ideal cases for doing them in you know, um, endoscopically and nasally. Right. Once the tumor extends beyond those boundaries, then it become then it becomes difficult to access those tumors from, from the nose. And that's where you need to start thinking about either doing combined approaches or, thi uh, or, doing, um, or, or doing it transcranially, doing it from a, removing these tumors from above. So these are kind of like, uh, this is, these are the things that you have to look at um, uh, and study the patient's films beforehand before you can decide what approach to, uh, to do. Um, uh, so, you know, switch, uh, switching gears a little bit. So, you know, in pre in, in, can you tell us a little about like the, the preparation for, for these patients? I, you know, uh, uh, what do you tell them prior to surgery? Um, uh, I know that we, we also use, uh, get some, image, you know, some specialized imaging studies that help us during during the surgery, can you give our audience a little yeah, idea yeah, about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, uh, definitely, I mean, a lot of these patients who come in uh, with uh, skull-based pathology, many times they have no nasal symptoms. That's right. So now you're going to have a patient with no nasal symptoms, so you got to prepare them that uh, what to expect. You know, uh, their nose may be uh, packed post-operatively, so you got to tell them that. Um, we are cl working closely to olfactory nerve, uh, although, you know, we don't usually, you know, damage it. But, you know, I mean, there's many of the uh, nerve endings of that olfactory nerve going down to the middle turbinate or, or uh, you know, uh, to some extent to the uh, upper part of the septum. So these are the things that you just have as a, uh, uh, you know, as an otolaryngologist trying to be careful not to, not to damage uh, these as uh, patients may complain about hyposmia postoperatively, uh, and that would be probably the most important thing. They don't right. care about anything else on the surgery. So these are the things that we prepare the patients uh, in terms of what to expect um, um, intraoperatively uh, and what to expect postoperatively. Um, and it is very important to obtain uh, and, uh, you know, um, uh, navigation uh, or navigated uh, CAT scans and MRIs sometimes, because uh, we do have uh, here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, uh, the cutting edge in terms of uh, these intraoperative navigations that we use, because it's, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, we're talking about a, a, a tiny area with very dense, uh, uh, with vessels, nerves that, uh, you know, uh, error uh, will not be um, accepted, you know. So it's really, the, you got to maneuver around the carotids, uh, uh, optic nerves, uh, and so on. So it is very important that to have that, and we were... Um, uh, blessed to have this here. In so let me ask you a question. So yeah. what, if you have patients that uh, will tell you, like, I have a deviated septum, you know, how does that change your, your management? Uh, well, it depends. Uh, you know, I mean, first we go with what the patient's complaining. Uh, and because, as you know, I mean, having a deviated nasal septum, not automatically that you need to correct it. That's okay. right. Uh, but the key thing is for me at the end of the day is if the deviated septum is going to affect the ex exposure or affect the reconstruction, mm -hmm. like say if I need to, to harvest a, a septal flab, uh, knowing that this is gonna be a high flow uh, leak, 
uh, CSF leak, then in, in that case, you know, we will definitely go ahead and, and correct it 100% because at that time you would raise the flap on one side and you will take that deviated bone or cartilage. Right. Uh, but if it's uh, not affecting, uh, you know, my reconstruction or my exposure, um, I would just uh, leave things alone and just as probably the patient has no complaints uh, preoperatively, uh, hopefully they will not have any complaints uh, uh, postoperatively. Right. Perfect. Okay. Um, at the same tone, you know, uh, can you tell the audience, uh, you know, um, how do you feel managing, you know, I'm sure, you know, complications can happen in sure. these cases. Can you just summarize maybe some of these uh, critical complications that we always watch for uh, and we try to avoid having so uh, we can have a, uh, um, uh, an excellent outcome, which is we do here at uh, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Well, yeah, so... Uh, as you said, complications can definitely happen. Fortunately, they're extremely rare, right? The, uh, you know, it, so when I talk to patients, I tell them basically, listen, we're, we're working around these structures. Any of these structures can be injured, right? So if you're talking about uh, vessels, you can have injuries to any, to uh, arterial injuries. You can have bleeding, uh, venous bleeding. You can have, uh, you're working on uh, the pituitary gland. You can have uh, hormonal dysfunction or hypo, if they're hypo, if they reach up to the hypothalamus, hypothalamic dysfunctions. You can, uh, you have the, obviously the nerve, the, uh, the optic nerves. Um, uh, you, you discussed already about the, uh, the, uh, the olfactory nerve. Um, so um, you, you're, you're breaching the skull base, you're approaching room below, so there's always the chance of having a, uh, a post-operative uh, CSF leak, and I'm sure we'll talk about the, recon the, the reconstruction after we remove these tumors. So these are all the various, the, you know, the various complications that can happen. And the more you do, you know, the, you know, the more you do of these cases, the, the more you know how to deal with the, deal with the com these complications, you know. So I think the most, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the the most devastating or the, the complication or the, the, the or the feared complication is, uh, is a vascular is having a vascular injury. And fortunately, this is extremely rare. If you look in the literature, it's anywhere between half a percent to about two and a half percent. You know, so it's uh, it's extremely extremely rare. And even when they do happen, and when they do happen, you know, uh, as long you know, as long as you have the experience to deal with it, that most you know most of them um, can be handled. Um, uh, so, you know, switching gears a little bit. So we've we've removed the you know removed our tumor, and now you got this. You have a hole in the base of your skull, right? So now we need to we can't leave that hole, and we need to somehow reconstruct the skull base. So can you just get you know give our audience uh, kind of an idea of uh, you know uh, how do we repair them? What are the different materials that we can use? Um, uh, what uh, you know uh, and also, in, in the uh, you know, just give them an idea of depending. I guess you'll, you'll talk about the CSF leaks, and, and that, that changes your algorithm of how you how you how you reconstruct and whatnot. Um, but then also ha that leads into kind of like the, your post-operative care. What you know, yeah. how, what you know, how do you uh, what what are your precautions after after surgery, and how do you, you know uh, uh, what restrictions do you have, and, and so forth. Give us okay. kind of give us a little idea. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so it's, uh, every patient is different. That's right. So so um, it's definitely, um, uh, first, I guess, let's talk about what materials do we use since we asked that question. Uh, we use all kinds, whatever is available, but uh, you, know, you can do autograft like fat uh, from, uh, from the thigh usually, but that's, I would say, 5% of the chances. So mm -hmm. a lot of our reconstruction is either a xenograft like coming from um, the endocardium of uh, bovine endocardium, um, or uh, the fascia lata of uh, you know bovine, uh, but uh, it also we um, sometimes we can use also um, allograft uh, material if uh, if it's available. But the question is whether it's a single layer, multi layer. That's also depends on other factors. You know, first the patient status. You know, are they malnutrition? Is it? Are we dealing with irradiated? Uh, field or not, obviously that's uh, that means if it's radiated or the patient's malnutrition, that means you really got to do a multi-layer. You got to really make sure you you you, you close it. But uh, the most important two factors is really the location, and obviously with the size. So when I say the location with the size, you know you have a clival defect. 
uh, definitely it's, uh, it's going to be more difficult than like a small cribriform uh, defect. Sure. And whether the leak is a high flow leak, like what we see with the clival uh, lesions versus uh, uh, other areas where it's a low flow leak. Mm -hmm. So the low flow leak, um, I think with a single layer, whether you do it an inlay or sometimes even an unlay, that's maybe enough mm -hmm. with packing. Um, but if it's a high flow leak, greater than one centimeter, definitely you really got to do a multi-layer, an inlay, uh, like, you know, for the defects in the um, uh, clival, I just use them as a, as a, as a classic, uh, one of the high flow leaks. Then you do an inlay kind of, uh, of uh, uh, a xenograft or allograft material followed by fat to, because you really need to get that uh, uh, dead space that's from the bone that you drill down. Um, and then you really need a vascularized flap. And, and the most common ones that uh, I use in my practice is really the uh, pedicle septal flap or a middle turbinate flap. Um, depending on the size, you know, obviously the septal flaps, you can get really large uh, mm -hmm. coverage where the med middle turbinate, I refer, um, are, you know, for a smaller defect. And obviously it depends on where is that located because some areas very anteriorly and high, like in the higher posterior table of the uh, frontal sinus, you really cannot access sure. and the pedicle septal flap will not reach there. Uh, so all these factors play a role. We do, um, if there is obviously uh, definitely a high flow leak, we do pack these patients mm -hmm. with like a Mersal pack besides the, um, the absorbable uh, material that uh, we also uh, place in the, in the nasal cavity. Um, and usually the packing remains for uh, six days. So mm -hmm. talking about shifting gear to the post-operative care, these... But, but most yeah. of the cases, they, 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 we usually don't have a leak in, in the vast majority of, of, the, of the cases. Correct. So right. we're, we're talking about like uh, uh, pituitaries mm -hmm. in particular, um, then that's usually the cases we don't. Right. Yeah. And if you have a, a tiny uh, a leak, what we call, you know, like you saw for a second and you don't see it anymore, uh, these, again, a single layer, um, an unlay or an inlay, uh, uh, usually an unlay, obviously, if you're dealing with a pituitary, right. that should be, uh, should be it. And in these, where we're talking the tiny leak or no leak, mm -hmm. I mean, these people, we don't put like a Marisol pack or something right. that we have to remove. So the patient can have a better quality of life in terms of nasal breathing and so right. on. But, what's your thoughts about lumbar drains? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, in my practice... You know, I, I know I've had worked with neurosurgeons who are either really very passionate about doing it in almost a, a right. lot of their cases. And they, I've worked with neurosurgeons who don't like to use it at all. And I'm like leaning more not to use it unless it's needed. So if, if you're dealing with a high flow leak or knowing that there will be high flow leak, I think it's a good thing to have for mm -hmm. about five days. Sure. Uh, you know, we do it like 10 cc an hour uh, and it's managed obviously by our colleagues in neurosurgery. Uh, um, and then we remove it, we clamp it and post up day five. Um, and then we remove the packing and post up day six if there is no leak we just have the neurosurgery team remove it. Right. Um, that's kind of the practice we do. I don't use it unless, as I said, there is a high flow leak or a large defect than one centimeter. Or like say, if we're doing like a spontaneous CSF leak, not a tumor, um, and we don't know, uh, we know it's a CSF leak with uh, confirmed with beta-2 transferrin, but we don't know where it is located, then I think uh, doing an intrathecal fluorescein with a lumbar drain, since we're going to inject it with the inter I might have just put a lumbar drain, mm -hmm. leave it for five days. I think in my practice, that will, 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 will be a good uh, option. All right. And tell us a little bit, like, what, what, are, the, what, what are patients going to expect after, after uh, such surgery? Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's uh, the biggest thing that they may have is just, obviously, the nasal congestion. And usually, as I said, depending on the packing, we try to pack maybe completely one side, the other side will be open so they can breathe. Then it's the congestion. And sometimes it's the pressure. They may feel just some pressure because of the packing inside the nose. Uh, but usually, you know, they are on pain medications that uh, uh, really cover uh, this uh, quite a bit. And uh, the patients are usually happy with that. Yeah. All right. Great. Yeah. And then and, uh, maybe, yeah, maybe the, one more question also is that uh, comes to mind is like, uh, when can you tell the patients that they're going to be, that, that, you know, 
the return to regular activities or you know so yeah. it's, it's, it's a great question yeah. just I was asked this just yeah. today one yeah. by one of my patients and uh, you know usually I would say uh, it depends on the case again but in general I would say skull base usually heals pretty good by six weeks most cases like average cases will heal no problem yeah. you know sometimes sooner uh, but I've seen patients sometimes take two to three months where they continue to have a lot of cresting. It takes them a long time to heal. Uh, but usually, as I said, these are the ones maybe radiated or uh, they had other uh, factors like systemic factors. But, uh, but usually I would say by six weeks, the skull base should have healed uh, even sooner, maybe four weeks, right. uh, some patients. All right, great. Okay. Um, uh, so let me ask you the last question here um, in terms of, or before I go to my last questions, we just about the post-operative care, we talked about the, the post-op day six, but usually also we put our patients on um, uh, stool softeners so they don't have to strain. Uh, we keep the head of bed elevated 35 to 45 degrees um, for the first week. Uh, unless they have a lumbar drain, because I know uh, you guys don't like uh, patients uh, with a lumbar drain on uh, elevated head, so we usually put them flat. Um, and then, um, uh, you know, we remove the packing and post-op day six, and the patient can go home sooner. It just, as I said, it depends sometimes, like say pituitary cases, the patients may have some hormonals that uh, checks that they need to stay in the hospital, but otherwise the patient can go home and they can come back mm. um, post-op day six and we can remove this in our clinic. They yeah, don't yeah. have to be in the hospital. For but that. actually for the lumbar drains, we do, no, as long as it, you know, uh, as long as it's a clamp, we actually keep the head, patient's you head. You can help it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. I see. That's good to, that's good to know that. Yeah. And uh, so I'll give you, I'll ask you the last question, Dr. Sami, and I really thank you for, uh, you know, being with us today is, I mean, where do you see the skull base surgery is going? Is there a, any innovation going on that you think it's going to take place in the next five to 10 years? Uh, you know, we have this big development in the early uh, 2000s, you know, are we going to see another generation of uh, development in the next uh, 10 years? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I don't have a crystal ball, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that hopefully there'll be medicines we don't have to do surgery, right? <laughs> that can yeah. to, to deal with these uh, these tumors. But with regards to like surgical innovations, it's, I, I think it's going to come from, you know, uh, more, uh, you know, the advancements of, uh, of the surgical uh, the surgical tools that they're more that they're more finer, um, uh, smaller, more delicate. Um, uh, the uh, I think one of the, you know uh, we still don't have uh, a good way to, play, to suture within those. It's very you know far away. There's, uh, so I think hopefully with development, you know, we'll be able to you know to make instruments that are small and fine enough that we can actually even suture the you know suture these these defects, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, I think. Uh, you know, uh, I think you know we have robotics uh, in medicine and in, in, in surgery Other right things, now, yeah. but I, I don't think the technology is uh, advanced enough or fine enough to uh, to replace the you know the, uh, human hands. But uh, I'm sure uh, in the future that uh, you know uh, I'm sure that that's gonna gonna be an, an, a, a, you know we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to find these tools you know. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll return the question to you. What are you? What are your thoughts? You I know. I mean, I think I definitely I I yeah. have been feeling that I think robotic surgery will be probably, yeah. uh, but it's not ready yet. I think you just uh, you know not able to sensate obviously right. the haptics, uh, the, right. you know so I agree. you know you don't know how far can you drill and as mm -hmm. you know the carotid right. is one millimeter away from right. your drill another bit. thing is the visualization you know at the endoscopes you know how much time is actually wasted from just cleaning the lens right from the blood from fog and so forth you know and uh, and i i just wish there was like a, a way that maybe the you know that that could develop maybe like a windshield wiper to, wiper to, yeah, to yeah, read the lens you know you'll you be know. surprised i think 50 years ago no one thought that we will be doing that's this true today. absolutely that's right 100 um so let me take this opportunity just to summarize yet. Uh, you know, I think here at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, we do have a comprehensive um, skull base uh, team uh, of uh, neurosurgeons, otolaryngologists, ophthalmologists, radiation oncologists, and medical oncologists that uh, we can manage all kinds of uh, uh, skull base uh, pathology. Uh, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we are proud that we were uh, one of the uh, teams uh, uh, 
chosen by the North American Skull Base uh, Society to be of the uh, teams of uh, multidisciplinary team of distinction here at uh, Cleveland Clinic um, Abu Dhabi. And uh, let me take this uh, opportunity again to thank Dr. Uh, Sami for being with us on this uh, episode. And uh, hopefully we'll uh, have maybe another session uh, down the road. Thank, thank you. you.